Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Theo Johnson Fried from Dalhousie University and the Perimeter Institute, who will tell us today about the classification of topological orders. Thanks so much, Theo. So thank you, thank you, Dave, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to to speak with you guys. Um, and um, so, so yes, yeah, so I want to tell you about um, what do I want to tell you about. So before I start anything, let me say I probably wrote too many slides, but you can read them at your leisure because they're posted on my website. Um, and um, maybe I'll begin. So I want the context of what I want to tell you about, the context of this word topological order is a context of, of the, the sort of question that's been around really since antiquity, which is to kind of understand the phases of matter, um, the phase of, like the sort of qualitative phases that, uh, that matter systems can be. And in grade school, we learned some basic phases like solid and liquid. Um, so, so let me kind of outline roughly what, what when people talking about phases of matter say, mean when they're talking about it. So if a matter system, a system of matter is, has, is, you'll usually imagine it has some UV or microscopic description, an ultraviolet description. It's called ultraviolet because the wavelengths of ultraviolet light are really, really small. I mean, X-rays are sort of subatomic in size. Um, so the microscopic description might be, you know, might be molecules bumping into each other. It might be spins up and down in a bar of iron. It might be quantum fields if you're um, if you're doing electromagnetism. And then when we talk about the phase of of a system, that's a that's really about kind of its long range qualitative behavior. It's it's long range properties. So this is called the infrared because you know X ray or sorry. Radio waves are bigger than I am. So they're certainly kind of nice macroscopic objects. And even in even a quote microwave in your microwave oven, that's still something human size. That's that's like something that you could hold between your fingers. So some of the types of properties that you might care about, for instance, you know, as I said, solid and fluid were the sort of notions that the that the people knew about since antiquity, but other properties like is the material ferromagnetic and why? Or is the material conductive? These are kind of long range effective notions. So with that said, let me just say that this is a really big question. It's a question that's been around for a really long time and it's maybe the driving question in kind of at least half of modern physics. It's like the Langlands program for physics is, is this question of understanding phases. Half of mathematicians do Langlands, half of physicists, half of it to, to phases as matter in some sense or another. Maybe, I mean, even string theorists, quantum field theorists, they're really studying, at the end of the day, they care about long range effective phenomena, they care about computing. them. So there's sort of two overlapping questions that you could ask. One of them is, can you classify all phases? And another is, can you understand the correspondence between ultraviolet and, and infrared phases? And in what you usually imagine is you usually imagine that um, most of the time, if you're standing at an ultraviolet description of a, of a system and change some parameters just a little bit, you usually sort of imagine that the, the infrared description didn't change. Like if you sort of, if you have something and you change the temperature slightly, temperature is a good parameter it's in, in this, this game to just keep in mind. But I mean, I don't care. You could, you could say this in terms of say, your parameter could be like how aqueous is a solution. So you sort of tend to imagine that, that if you change the parameter a little bit, like change the temperature a little or change how aqueous something is, you don't change the, the IR description. You don't change, you know, is it in solution or is it precipitate? Is it kind of solid or liquid? Of course, there are special cases where you're at a phase transition and we're changing the parameter a little to one side or the other, could either make something precipitate out or could make something solidify. But by and large, you think that this is a many to one map. Um, and and it's a, the heart of it is it's the reason is a hard problem is that it's it's pretty much inaccessible to kind of perturbation or Feynman diagrammatic techniques in quantum in quantum field theory. Um, it's not something that the that you can compute with Feynman diagrams. And I mean I, I come from maybe quantum field theory, so I'm going to use that as my as my examples all the time. So. 
there is a method that people have developed in the 20th century to answer this problem, to understand phases and to answer this problem. And it goes under the name of the Lando paradigm. And I'd like to kind of introduce it by an example. The example is um, that I decided to choose was anhydrous sodium chloride. So anhydrous just means it's, that it's not, there's no water around. Um, and microscopically, I'm gonna remind you that the microscopic description is a bunch of ions just sort of vibrating bumping and moving around and bumping into each other. So at high temperatures, um, if you have these ions, they sort of have a fair amount of thermal, of thermal activity, they bump around, they flow around, and your effective theory is of a liquid. And so the effective description are the, the equations of a liquid. The, um, you know, those are hard equations to solve, but they're, they're, we sort of, we have a good sense of what they are. And all I wanna encode about the equations of a liquid is that liquids don't have, at least sort of normal liquids don't have distinguished directions. In them. So the, the being, if you're a liquid, you, your phase is invariant under translations in space and also all arbitrary rotations in space. At low temperatures, sodium chloride crystallizes out. That's what, what's down in my kitchen um, because this is very, very high temperature. Um, and and it, so it's macroscopically a crystal. You can actually go and pick up a little grain of salt and you'll see that it is a cube crystal. And any particular crystal of salt has distinguished directions to it. It has these sort of three planes in it. And the, the rotation symmetry breaks to um, some discrete group symmetry. Um, the translation symmetry is still effectively there. This lattice spacing, the this distance between the ions is so much smaller than anything you're gonna be able to see with your eyes. So this is still a translation invariant effective theory, but it's not rotationally invariant anymore. That, that symmetry broke and it broke spontaneously. As the material was crystallizing, it had equal probability of picking, of just ending up with any direction. And it just, it just that, that's the sort of probabilistic phenomenon. And you can really see it's, it's square. You can like take a crystal of salt and, and hit it and it'll fracture, fracture preferentially in certain directions. If you hold it up to light, it looks in it's sort of different opacities. So this is really macroscopic that, that this happens. And when this happens, the, the kind of Landau story would have called it ordered as opposed to the sort of disordered situation that has more symmetry. Um, so that's, so that picture, so the, the picture that Landa developed or that goes under his name anyway, is that phases are classified by these patterns of, of the symmetry and the symmetry breaking. Um, and this is a really remarkably effective picture. It explained pretty much all of 20th century phases of matter, both classical and quantum. And it suggests a solution to this UV to IR problem. The solution it suggests is look at your UV description and work out all of the symmetries of it, or at least work out a lot of them. Work out a large group of symmetries, as large as you can, and measure basic properties of them. For a, a, a typical property a quantum field theory measure would be it's anom the anomaly of the symmetry. And this is a sort of fancy quantum field theory version of asking is the, the action on the Hilbert space linear or projection. Any of you know, any of you who remember your quantum mechanics class will remember that, that um, groups can act projectively on the Hilbert space. And that's important when you're studying quantum mechanics to keep that. Um, and if you wanna talk later, there's this is basically the concept of anomaly, but because it's in quantum field theory, um, the Hilbert space should be built sort of locally out of local Hilbert spaces. And so you can ask this kind of in a, this projectivity is a sort of more subtle local property. But other than that, that's what this is measuring. Um, and then once you've done that computation, that severely constrains the possible IR phases. Um, it, it severely constrains the, the possible patterns of symmetry breaking. Like you have to identify a subgroup and, and um, the anomaly constrains it a bit. And um, then, so you work out all the possible patterns of symmetry breaking, you work out what the phase with that pattern of order is and you're, you're done. You've solved the problem. Um, and this is great, as I said, it explains lots of examples, but it turns out to be wrong. It turns out that this does not explain all phases of matter. So the, the context that, that where I 
came from this, you know, sort of that I had kind of motivated me was a discovery in um, the turn of the, the most recent turn of the century, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, um, that there are phases in quantum field theory um, which violate the Landau paradigm. And the phases that people know about that violate it, these are somehow very deeply quantum. The Landau paradigm looks like it's just true for classical systems. But, but there are deeply quantum phases with, with very long range entanglement, where there's no way to understand the, the, the sort of, so these are, these are phases in, so the, I should, these phases, um, not only do they, do they have very long range entanglement, in fact, all of the information is in the long range entanglement. All of the information is somehow buried in how different, different parts of the system are entangled with each other. And if you ask locally in your system, what are you? What do you, how do you respond to me? The system will just say, I'm nothing, I'm locally trivial. So in particular, these are systems that have no local operators at all, at least no local operators in the, in the infrared. Of course, microscopically, there are local operators um, in, in the examples people know about, at least in the kind of exa examples you can build in a laboratory. But, um, but the, the energy scales of the local operators are, um, are way too high. There's too much to, to probe in the infrared. Um, energy and distance are, and length scales are inverse to each other um, in special relativity. Um, let me just mention that like long range, this is actually really useful these phases because you can do quantum computing or you can try to do quantum computing with them because there's this sort of robustness, robust um, information encoding. Um, and so these are systems where the information is not the sort of what, what creates the phase is not symmetry, but rather something much more subtle about topology, um, about the topology of the long range entanglement. So let me sort of, to really drive home the point, let me just emphasize that, that since the system is really locally trivial, there's no local operators at all in the system. In particular, if you ask a question like, how does the system respond to changing the geometry a little bit? Well, changing the geometry is applying a local operator. Since there are no local operators, okay, by no local operators, I mean no non-trivial local operators. Let me actually write that. No, the only local operators are the multiples of the identity operator. And so the question of how does the system respond when you change the geometry, that must be a multiple of the identity operator, which means your system doesn't see geometry at all. It's a totally topological thing. It's invariant under all diffeomorphisms. It's like even more than a liquid. A liquid was invariant under some diffeomorphisms, maybe volume preserving diffeomorphisms or something. This is invariant under all diffeomorphisms completely. Um, and, and so that's what you mean yes. by a topological liquid? That's what I'm going to take as the definition of topological liquid. I should, I should of course, acknowledge that I, um, you know, I learned all of this by like listening to people, uh, you know, my, my degrees in mathematics, I'm just uh, employed as a physicist, so I don't know what they mean, but yes, I think when physicists talk about it, that's, this is basically their meaning of topological liquid. Okay, that's good enough for me. Um, you know, so you're, you're asking me as a sociologist or a linguist now, not it, so. Um, okay, so, so given how almost trivial, how locally trivial the system is, you could ask like, how do you even tell that it, how could such a phase be non-trivial? What could you tell that would, would convince you that it was non-trivial? And the answer is that although there are no local operators, these phases tend to have extended operators. Um, so, the point is that a local operator, that's something that you can do to your quantum system localized in space and time. You pick some location in space, you pick some specific time or maybe a very small region in space and a very small region in time to do that, that operator, that measurement. Operators are the same as measurements in quantum mechanics. There are also operators that, that um, to do them kind of twist around in higher dimensions. And these are not foreign in quantum field theory. They're something familiar already from Maxwell theory, from, from electromagnetism. Um, 
So a, a typical example, this is a, not a topological example. I'm just doing an example kind of from, from um, the late 19th century is um, the, the Maxwell theory of, a, of just a photon field, no, um, no matter. If you have just a photon field, then there's an operator that I'm gonna call a test electron. It's an operator that tells you how would an electron respond to this background electromagnetic field if an electron existed. What I really mean by that is you take an electron and you like drag it along yourself. It's a, not a dynamical thing. It's a thing that you as, a, as the measurer sort of gets to control. You drag it along and you ask, um, as it goes along, it feels some forces. Let's, let's find out the total work that was done or the total um, force that it received along that path. And, and if you're a mathematician, then this is asking what is the, um, this is mathematically, this is asking, um, the holonomy of the photon field. The photon field is some type of connection and this is asking for its holonomy. Um, because it's a holonomy of a, of a connection, it is actually something you can write down by integrating local operators um, if you're clever. Um, in electromagnetism, there's also test magnetrons, which um, are, well, what dimension they are depends. In fact, their co-dimension is always three, not their dimension. So the electrons, they're always lot, but sort of uh, line in space time and magnetrons are always co-dimension three. So in, in dimension four, especially you have electromagnetic duality. And I wanna mention just that these operators don't commute. They, they detect each other. If you wind a magnetron and electron around each other, you can, you can pick it up. You can tell that they're there. So the failure for them to commute tells you that they're present in the system. It's how you do the measurements. Um, exactly the same phenomenon applies in, in topological phases as well. So I copied half of this slide. So there may be one of the first topological, topologically ordered phases that was really studied and the one that every single condensed matter theorist likes to start a talk with. I mean, it is the textbook example of a topological phase it's called the toric code. And a quantum field theorist would call it Z mod two gauge theory. Uh, the new one gauge there. It's like electromagnetism, except instead of a U1 connection, you just have a Z mod 2 connection. So there's no local information in the connection, but there's global information in the um, monodromous of the field. And that's the difference here, is that that's why this is topological. Um, Z toric code also has test electrons and test magnetrons. Um, and I drew the pictures in two plus one, in two, two space and one time dimension. Um, the pictures are the, the sort of commutation relation, the analog in this, in this algebra of higher operators of saying that some that two, two operators don't commute is that if you take an electron and a magnetron and twist them around each other, that's not the same as doing them next to each other, it's actually minus the, the same. It has to be kind of a phase different. I mean, it, it can't be too different because, um, but, but it's, it picks up a minus sign. And then there's some other relations that tell you the rest of the Torah code algebra. These are analogs of saying that x squared is one in, an, in, an, a, lower, in, a, in a lower categorical algebra. They don't, they don't immediately tell you whether your algebra is commutative or not. So um, anyway, that was sort of my, my, my pre-say on, on um, topological liquids, and I'm conveniently going faster than I thought, which is great. Um, so, so now let me um, tell you some mathematics. So at the kind of pre-talk, we discussed some of the mathematics that, that you know, goes into this. So uh, mathematical axioms are the following. Um, so the words topological order and topological liquid, I'm gonna use um, interchangeably. This word topological order is really due to Shokin Wen, who was one of the main theorists of kind of introducing all of these notions. So the axiom that I wanted to, to present is the following. So let's define, let's sort of decide that a phase of matter is really determined operationally, that, that the information you have is the algebra of operators that you can measure. This is, this is a very reasonable way of, of trying to axiomatize physics. I'm not gonna assume that there's a Hilbert space. I'm just gonna assume I have an algebra of operators. Um, I'll call it an algebra of, in quotes because it's an algebra of extended operators. So it's not 
say, a vector space with a multiplication. Rather, if I'm in n space and one time dimensions, um, then this algebra is really going to be a monoidal n category. Um, let me kind of give a brief sense of, of why it should be a monoidal n category. Well, whatever the n dimensional operators are, the sort of maximal dimension of an operator, the co-dimension one operators, um, those will be the objects of my category. And the, the monoidal structure is that I, I can sort of put operators on, on parallel sheets. And because I'm in a topological system, the distance between these sheets is not physically meaningful. So the fusion that I, the tensor product is that I just sort of zoom very far away. And then the two sheets look really close to them. This is something you could have done in any you know, kind of conformal system. Um, if you have a sheet, then you can have kind of morphisms between sheets. So more generally, you could have like a, a, a co-dimension one junction where between sheets that could have its own physics. And in particular, a special class are the, the n minus one dimensional operators. These are the junctions from the unit operator to itself. So that's, that's part of the data in my system. And you can keep going. So this N category, um, it contains all of the operators of all different dimensions. It knows about all of them and it knows how they're interacting. Um, so that's gonna be the first, this isn't the complete definition. This is just like slide one of a couple about this, this definition. This is just sort of setting the, the groundwork for what, where we're working. And, um, if there are any category theorists here, n category for me is going to mean a weak n category or an n comma n category. And if you're not a category theorist, you should ignore that comment. That's why I didn't write it. Um, so this is the context: is that I have that I'm going to encode the information in my quantum liquid as a um, as a monoidal n category. Um, but now I need to kind of constrain what types of monoidal n categories can arise. So, um, so the monoidal n category, here are the, the axioms that I'm gonna demand about my monoidal n category. Uh, the first axiom I'm gonna demand is basically the axiom that tells me that I'm in a quantum world. So in a quantum world, you can always take superpositions. And in n categories, those, the sort of right way to take superpositions, um, well, there's a couple different things, but, but you can add um, top dimensional operators, the sort of vertex, the operators that are supported at points really do kind of have an, a, a just an additional on the usual sense of kind of, in fact, they're a vector space over the complex numbers, uh, maybe even a Hilbert space over the complex numbers. Um, the category should have direct sums. That's a way of adding um, kind of objects of a category that aren't the top, that aren't the kind of the top morphisms. So that's a type of superposition. And then another sort of more subtle type of superposition is, is Karubi completion, um, which we discussed in the pre-talk and that I'm gonna not say more about now. Um, this is something you would, you would uh, you should demand for any quantum field theory, not necessarily for any kind of quant effective quantum field theory, not necessarily a topological liquid. The next axiom I want to demand is basically being what um, what forces your system to be this sort of highly topological. I'm not going to spell out the details right now unless somebody asks, but I'm happy to. Um, these end up being basically very strong finiteness conditions. Um, we've had we have this picture now in that's been around since well, it really came in the very late 90s in the 90s, and it's been now a theorem that that in order to give a very topological quantum objects, um, quantum field theory, you have to give, that's the same as giving good finiteness properties. And they boil down to the idea that you should be able to put your system on a space time that looks like, like kind of that has some folds and creases. In it. And if you ask that kind of, it makes sense to put your system on spaces like this, you, you end up with kind of strong finiteness conditions on your algebra. Maybe I will say a little bit actually, to just give a sense, I won't give the definition, but I'll give a sense of what these finiteness conditions mean. So if you are, um, if you ha hang out with sort of the right people, these finance conditions will be familiar. They're the, they're the axioms of um, multi-fusion category. That's the type of condition I have in mind. 
Um, and if you are even a kind of lower category person than that, if you're just an, a representation theorist, these finiteness conditions are also familiar to you. They're the axioms of being a semi-simple finite dimensional algebra. So these are the sort of most finite algebras you can have. Semi-simple finite dimensional algebras are finite in the sense that their dimension is finite, but they're also finite in that their representation theory is, is very finite. Um, the next axiom I want to ask is, is an axiom, maybe the most important axiom is an axiom that's called remote detectability. So this axiom physically says the following. It says that if I have my system, everything about my, the, my quantum field theory should be determined by the operators, including the operators themselves. So how would I ever know that I've done an operator insertion? Well, to know that I've done an operator insertion, I'd have to measure that with some other operator insertion. And the way operators get to measure each other is some sort of commutator. And so the remote detectability axiom is the sort of, the, its meaning is that um, the only invisible operators, the only operators that are, that are invisible to commutators, so the only central operators, those should be the scalar multiples of, of, the, of the identity operator. And all other operators should be, should be detectable. And in category theory, this is like the triviality of the Drinfeld center. Um, so these two axioms together Wait, sorry, what are- What did you say again? What did you say again? That this is, this is for category theorists, this is what? For category theorists, um, I'm saying that, so what I'm saying, whether you're a category theorist or not, is I'm saying that my algebra should have trivial center. The center should just be the multiples of the identity. And so um, if, you're, if you're a category theorist, center means Drinfeld center. And if you're a representation theorist, center just means center. Um, and thank you. If you're a braided category theorist, then center means Mugger center. I mean, there's lots of names that you could put. That's okay. I just didn't hear you. That was all. Oh. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that these two concepts together, um, even in lower cat, even in sort of uncategorical, if you're just a, a ring theorist, these are still a really interesting pair of concepts. This this first one I told you was being basically finite dimensional and semi simple, and now I'm saying that it should have trivial center. So together, that's to say that you're a central simple algebra, which we know is a really interesting subject. There's a lot of number theory, a lot of, of field theory, Galois theory about, about classifying central simple algebras. The very last axiom is one that I think is somehow a little bit more debatable, but I'm going to put it on for, the, for today, um, which is I'm going to call, I'm going to ask that my systems be what I'm going to call robust. They should be robust against local perturbations to my theory. And in, in um, the physical way that you, the sort of way to, to say that is you should demand that also there are no point operators. So all the point operators in your theory should be scalar multiples of the identity. See there, these axioms, there could have been point operators. They just would have to sort of fail to commute with something else. They commute with each other, but they may fail to commute with something else. Here, I wanna say there, there are no point operators. The physics of this is the following. Um, if you did have non-trivial point operators, then there would be ways to modify, make a very small deformation to your physical, to your physics by using those operators. You could deform the Hamiltonian just a little bit by one of those operators. And it would trigger a, a, um, a phase transition into sort of a system with fewer ground states. So in general, the point operators are some sort of ring and the ground states, the local ground states are like the spectrum of that ring. And, and I'm saying that there's only, only one local ground state. Otherwise you could trigger a, a decay into one. So these non-robust systems are actually really important in the subject because non-robust systems show up as soon as you start studying critical phenomena. Um, the, like having multiple local operators, that's like when you're on a, at a critical state between two phases. So I, I, you know, I don't wanna kind of completely abandon them, but, they're, but for classification problems, maybe that it's too hard to classify all phase transitions. Let me just try to classify the phases themselves first. Okay, so that's the that is the complete list. Um, yeah. Can so, you go back? And, can you go back for a minute and and 
You have fusion written there. Did you talk about fusion? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't talk about it. I somehow, when I wrote these slides, assumed I wouldn't say everything. And now it seems like I do have time to say everything. Um, so so I, this is just a word for people in the know. This, the word fusion um, is a special case of this word multi-fusion. Um, a, a category is fusion when it's um, finite semi-simple and rigid monoidal and the unit object is simple. And this no vertex op, no point operators is equivalent to saying that the unit object is simple. Okay, thanks. So, so I on the one hand, I want you to think that these are central simple algebras. Um, I also want you to think that these are these are sort of higher fusion categories, higher central simple algebras and higher fusion categories at the same time. Um, yeah, actually, it was an interesting history. So the word fusion was much older and kind of maybe it was a word the physicists were banding around on their own. And um, maybe, you know, it was a subject of lots of books, even in the, the 90s, like Bakalov and Kirillov's work. And I think kind of this word multifusion was then introduced a bit later, maybe by the heading off at all, um, because they realized they needed the case of when the unit wasn't simple as well to understand the whole subject. Um, so I, I put these up sort of, before I go on, let me just say, I put these up kind of in this very, um, I wanted to sort of give the definition in, in the sense of its meaning rather than the actual words, but these are what's, what's really new, what's exciting and new is that in the last say three years, we now have the machinery in higher category theory to actually kind of implement all of these words in n categories. So for one category, as people have been able to say Karubi completion and semi-simplicity and so on for a really long time. And it's only in the last couple of years that we've with sort of this kind of culmination of, of decades and decades of higher category theory, maybe, well, maybe not culmination, in the, along the way of decades and decades of higher category, there, there surely will be lots of other category theory. Um, but relying on decades and decades of, of category theory, we now know how to say these words for n categories in general. And I sketched some of that in the free talk for the people who, who made it. Um, so you should ask them because they all learned it very well. So, um, okay, so, so now let me, let me kind of say a bit about what we know about the classification of these. Um, we're, we're kind of well on our way to having a complete classification of, of these words. So let's start in some trivial cases. So let's be in zero plus one D in quantum mechanics. Well, in zero plus one D, um, I really sort of um, ruled it out. I said there should be no point operators, but in quantum mechanics, the only operators are point operators. You just insert them at times on the world, on the world line. So if there's no non-trivial point operators, but there's only point operators, then all the operators are trivial and you're just, your only ring is the, the complex numbers, whatever ground field you're working on. So there's only one um, robust quantum liquid in zero plus one day. What about in one plus one day? It's slightly more complicated, but not much. So um, there are a priori point and line operators. Um, there's a slightly non-trivial statement. So point operators in one plus one D, those are things that kind of you insert at points on the, on the, um, in space time. They obviously commute with each other because we're topologically, you can just move them around. Line operators are something you can insert kind of on lines. They don't obviously commute with each other. And you might have thought maybe line operators could be there because maybe they could detect each other. That's a good thing to think. It turns out non barely non-trivial theorem. I mean, a, a sort of probably any graduate student who knows some, some category theory could prove it is that if you insist on this remote detectability hypothesis, then every line operator is detected by some point operators. For every line operator, there are point operators that, that don't commute with them. And so if you also detect that there's, if you also insist on robustness, then there can't be any non-trivial line operators. And so um, also in one plus one D, there's only one top sort of liquid and it's the vacuum. So 
um, to summarize what I've told you so far is that in, in both zero and one plus one dimensions, there are no inherent, there's no inherent topological order. There's no way to have a topologically ordered state, um, at least not one that's robust against these definitions. There are these sort of subtle things that can happen and like you can kind of, there's a sort of subtle things where you can sort of have a non-trivial phase transition from the vacuum to itself, but, um, but not much. In fact, bosonically, you can't even do that. If you had some spin structures, then there would be some interesting ways to transition from the vacuum to itself. Um, there's still a little bit of interesting stuff here because symmetries can have anomalies, but there's somehow nothing like in, in these dimensions, the Landau paradigm seems to just be, be exact. It seems to. And then all of a sudden you get to three total dimensions. Two, two space in one time, and then the world explodes. Um, and these were these were really discovered, you know, right around 1990 when they were first discovered. And in two plus one dimensions, the classification is is more or less by modular tensor categories. Um, so the way this works is the following. Again, um, there's a priori surface operators, but um, it turns out that that the same thing is true that that like basically because surface operators, um, yes, yeah, so it turns out that all surface operators kind of end up, it's a slightly non-trivial statement, but it turns out there's a theorem implicit here. Um, the theorem that's implicit here is, the, is a version of the statement that the category theorists will recognize that the map from the Drinfield center down to the fusion category is dominant. That's the, somehow the essence of, of this statement. Um, and the effect of this statement is that actually, if you're robust and have remote detectability, then all your surface operators have this sort of microscopic description as, as little networks. They're, they're sort of porous. Um, so, so the data of what networks can form is, is information entirely encoded in the line operators, in, in the one category of line operators and, and kind of the junctions between line operators. And so, so the, to tell you a two plus one D phase, I have to tell you the line operators, but the line operators can be extremely rich. Lines in two plus one D get to braid um, and the braiding is not, there's not this remote detectability axiom tells you the braiding is not degenerate. Um, and so that's that's essentially modular tensor categories. And I just want to mention that this is a hopeless classification. I don't know. I mean, there's people who work really hard on it, and I I, I admire their their um, their hutzpah to do it because, um, as far as I can tell, we're it's it's we're never going to do it. I just think that the the pat, there's it's just completely wild. Like it's it's sort of um, as far as I can tell, this problem of classifying modular tensor categories is exponentially more complicated than classifying finite groups. I don't mean finite simple groups, those were hard. I mean, like even classifying finite groups, that's impossible because you'd have to like list all groups of order, you know, 2048 or something like that. And you're never gonna do it. And this is exponentially harder than that. Um, I mean, Maybe we just don't really have good understanding of what the simple objects are, but but I just I, I just don't think I think it's like, I think it's like getting a general picture is helpless. Sort of in these classification problems, we sort of pretend that that class that the problem if you can boil it down to classifying finite groups, that's the easy part. Then you feel like you've you've done the problem, um, and this is not going to happen. Um, let me talk in a couple more dimensions. So um, I got into the subject because I wanted to know what was going on in three plus one D. I knew that two plus one D was too hard. And then there were a pair of really inspirational papers by Lan Kong and Lin and Lan and Wen um, that were inspirational and quite non-rigorous um, and really kind of made some, some assumptions that they that really looked quite surprising. And that then I had to go in and, and do some work to prove. Um, so let me tell you what the actual final answer is. So in 3D, so in 3 plus 1D, again, there's this non-trivial theorem that I that I drew on the previous picture that the co-dimension one operators actually are always networks of co-dimension two operators. That happens in every dimension if you have this robustness axiom. Um, 
this, this needs robustness. Um, and so all of the interesting data is in the lines and surfaces. These are lines and surfaces in four total dimensions, which is to say they're particles and strings moving around in three plus in three space and one time dimension. Particles moving around in three space and one time dimension um, can't have interesting statistics. They're either bosons or fermions. My way of saying that mathematically is that the, the, uh, the category of line operators is a symmetric monoidal category. And we understand all symmetric monoidal categories. Every symmetric monoidal category has a subcategory of bosonic objects. And that subcategory is always the representations of a finite group canonically. And either the subcategory is the whole category or it's of index two. So by taking the subcategory of bosonic objects, what you can do, you can recognize it as rep G and you can trigger a phase transition which ungages the G action. This is, this is just physics jargon for um, doing some you know, some sort of procedure with a choice of fiber functor. Um, and the fact that I've ungaged the G action is, is just a way of saying that the fiber functor had a symmetry by G. So you start with your original phase, you trigger a phase transition and you end up with a new phase. And that new phase, well, it will either be completely trivial if all of your objects were bosonic, or it'll be almost trivial. It'll sort of have index, it'd be sort of two dimensional if, um, if you had some fermions. And you can really constrain it. It's a, an almost trivial symmetry system. It has a residual G symmetry on it. And you can go back um, across the phase transition by gauging that G symmetry. So actually every phase is an almost trivial phase with a G symmetry. Now G symmetries, if, if this is really the trivial phase, if this is just the trivial phase, then the G symmetries that can act on it are classified by ordinary cohomology. They're, they're classified by their digraph Witten action. And if you're sort of this almost sim trivial, this case where you had some fermions around, there's a sort of slightly more complicated but still cohomological classification of what can happen, of a thing called super cohomology. Um, and, and that's it. And I wanted to mention that um, the, there are these two phases that you can get on the other side. Um, and it took us a really long time. It's actually a really hard problem that we've solved with David Reuter so that those two phases um, can't themselves be separated. One of them can be gapped all the way out. You can trigger, one of them has the property that you can trigger a phase transition all the way to the vacuum. And the other one cannot. And it's sort of not separable, separable from the vacuum by a, by a um, gapped interface. Um, this, is, this is equivalent to some um, sort of deep statements in modular tensor category theory. So, um, so that was what's going on in three plus one D. Before you move on, before yeah. you move on. Of course. Is that four equal three plus one? Uh, yeah. Or is your H four related to the, the fact that this, you're in three plus one dimension? Exactly, that's exactly right. This four is, is this three plus one. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, liter literally what you do is that, that a class here gives you uh, um, basically like a, a Chen Simons type functional on all G bundles. And the gauge theory is sort of um, a sum over those. It's like a good. You know, I, I also have a question on this. Um, yeah. So here, right, you've classified these in terms of, well, you say there's a phase transition to these almost trivial systems of G symmetry, and, and we know all of these. Mm -hmm. Can you also classify the phase the, the phase transitions that these things have? No, not at all. So um, the theorem is that every topological order has a canonical phase transition to one of these. You can recover the topological order from one of these. Um, and so that gives you a kind of complete list. And it actually classifies your problems that are it, even better, you can you can really write down the higher groupoid of all three plus one topological orders. Um, but 
as, as you suggest, there are lots of other phase transitions, lots of other gap domain walls between these phases that are somehow not um, that are that are just other things you can do. In particular, here's a silly thing you could do. You could take any 3D, any 2 plus 1D topological order, so any modular tensor category, and you can insert it in your system. Um, and think of it as a phase transition from your system to itself. So any system kind of has an interesting phase transition for any modular tensor category. And then you can do more complicated things. You can kind of mix modular tensor categories with, with G symmetry. And, and so I probably could sit down and tell you phase transitions are sort of G braided something somethings and then like get the problem back to the problem of classifying modular tensor categories. I never, I haven't done it, um, but it would be of that form. G cross, no, and the G cross modular tensor categories is sort of the type of words that would be there. Thank you. Um, let me mention four, four plus one days. So um, together with Matthew Yu, who's a PhD student of mine at the Perimeter Institute, um, we've done a kind of, I wouldn't call it a complete classification. We've done a partial classification of four plus one days. The reason I wouldn't call it complete is because we don't quite understand all the group weight of all four plus one D phases. We understand the set of all isomorphism classes. We can list that set um, at least. Well, we can't even quite, well, I'm pretty sure we could list it if we needed. So let me tell you what we know. Um, after, first of all, it's a, this here, when I was doing this, I was sort of studying the symmetric monoidal category. And I had to distinguish whether there were whether all the lines were bosonic or whether there were some fermionic lines. And the reason for that was because Tanakhian duality isn't perfect for bosonic categories. Super Tanakhian duality is much, much cleaner. Every super symmetric category has a fiber to super vector spaces. Um, a physicist says the word super by saying that they're adding in a spin structure or a local fermion. Those are the words a physicist would use. Uh, can I ask a question about yeah. your, 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 you were talking about super, super things. Is this, yeah. is this Z2 graded or, or is, that, is that what you mean or you mean something That's different? right. By super, super means two things. Um, super means, um, it means two things simultaneously. Like it means, it means, you know, A, like you have to do two things to say super. First thing you have to do is everything in the world should be Z2 graded. Second of all, you have to change your mind on what commutative means. So you have yes. to decide so, that commutative means the causal sign rules. And those are those are with both choices um, that you had to make. And that, that's what super means. So yeah, so a super category is one all of whose morph sort of which doesn't all whose like spaces and morphisms are Z2 graded. Um, and it starts getting really interesting because if you want to say what is a natural transformation of super functors? Well, naturality, somewhere in the axioms of a natural transformation was some commutativity. And if you've changed your mind what commutative means, then you've actually changed your mind what natural transformation means. And so it does sort of affect a lot of the category theory, but you can do it systematically just with by saying, like, you just sort of chant the word enriched category enough times and then, and then it works out. Okay, so what I want to say is that after coupling to a spin structure, we do understand all phases quite well. We know them as a set. And what we know is you can do the same game as before. You can condense out all of the lines. So you can kind of ungage a G symmetry. Um, so, and so going back, if I start, okay, one of those directions is if I'm starting from the vacuum and building up my theory, or if I'm starting with my theory and building it down. If I start with at my theory and, and decompose it, the first thing I can do is condense out all the lines, recognize it as a G gauge theory, perhaps with some extra matter. After I do that, I still have some surface operators. Um, and these we showed, um, you can always realize as a kind of what's called a one form gauge theory. Um, this is like a gauge theory for a group, except for instead of a group, it's a group, it's a like a kind of homotopical group. So a group is a thing whose classifying space only has homotopian homotopicals agree one. And a one form group is a thing whose classifying space only has homotopy and homotopicals agree two. 
And it's not my fault that the numbering is off. This is just the way the physicists use the numbering and we're stuck with it. So is that um, known as a two group or sometimes a categorical one group? Is that a-, a Two group is a thing which has homotopy. A two group is a thing who's, um, which has two homotopies, specifically in degrees one and two. I mean, it's, it's classifying space has two homotopies specifically in degrees one and two. Um, and when a physicist says two group, they also implicitly mean that the Postnikov extension data connecting those two homotopy groups is non-trivial. Otherwise, they don't consider that to be a, a, an honestly two group. Um, but they don't tend to like say that very carefully because only some physicists know what Postnikov extension data is. Um, Anyway, so this, this gives a classification in the presence of a local fermion. Um, I want to emphasize that, so if you wanted to start with the vacuum, what I'm telling you is that every theory here is a gauge theory. You start with the vacuum, you gauge a one form symmetry and then you gauge a zero form symmetry. Um, and I just want to flag that that's not, you cannot do that all in one step. This is not gauging a two group. And the reason it's not gauging a two group is because the zero form symmetry can act by electromagnetic duality on the one form gauge theory. That's a thing that's allowed to happen in this degree, in this dimension. Um, and there we have some redundancy in this list. Um, there's different, slightly different things that you can do that will give you the same, the same four plus one D phase. We can basically control that redundancy. We can kind of pick best representatives, but, um, but it's not, we don't, because of that redundancy, we don't quite understand the groupoid of these. We just understand the set of them. By kind of picking good representatives. Um, this is the case after coupling to a local fermion. Before coupling to a local fermion, it just wowed us. It really surprised us when we did the classification um, because, because the convinced matter theorist would not expect the answer. Um, what it turns out when we do the classification before coupling to a local, well, well, the way you do it is you do the classification with a local fermion, and then you ask, what do you need to do to uncouple the local fermion? There's extra data needing, needed to decouple the local fermion. So to decouple the spin structure, um, it turns out there's infinitely many different ways you can do that. These are, these are, there's basically one way for every two torsion element in the, wick, in the what's called the fermionic wick group, okay? the slightly degenerate wick group. Um, so is this yeah. the same, is this the same bit that I would know from number theory? Um, yeah, and, and he didn't actually construct this, what I call the fermionic group. It is the same that the history is that there's a thing that he did construct, which is a group of um, finite abelian groups equipped with a metric. So equipped with a non-degenerate quadratic form. And that group is a subgroup of this group. Um, and that's where the name came from. Okay, thank so, you. Um, but in particular, any two torsion element in this actual group will give you an interesting way to decouple um, the spin structure. Um, and there's already some of those. I think every like half of the primes give you one or something like that. I don't know. I, I'm teaching, I, you know, I should know this off the top of my head because we just did the Gaussian image recently in my, um, in my algebra class. Um, I should probably wind up when wind up. So let me sort of bring things back and just mention sort of what I think the, the, the next century will hold in this story. So I told you that the, these topological liquids, they violate the Landau paradigm, but they don't really violate the Landau paradigm. What they do is they force you to generalize the Landau paradigm. Um, whenever you have a symmetry of a quantum system, you can always encode it as a codimension one symmetry up. It's an operator that when you pass it over some other thing, it kind of, it moves around topologically itself. And when it passes over some other insertion, it, uh, other insertion gets acted on by your symmetry. And these higher groups we were just discussing, um, they can also be encoded as invertible topological operators just of higher codimension. And, um, the presence of higher codimensional operators, that's forced in quantum field theory. 
And the, the operators of different dimensions, in fact, are inextricably linked because they're, and the linking is the Sposnikov extension data that we mentioned briefly. But there's another thing that, that quantum really forces you to do. If you're quantum, then you can take direct sums. And that means that it's allowed to have simple operators. In decomposable operators nevertheless have a fusion, which is a direct sum. And when that happens, these operators just are not invertible. If they're topological, you should still consider them as symmetries. And, and it's by, I wanna say that as like a, a moral statement, it is useful to treat these as symmetries. It's useful to, to analyze your system as if these are symmetries. In some sense, the idea of the analyzing non-invertible symmetries is, is ancient. It's the, it's like, the idea of, of say, you know, studying a completely integrable system by working at a large algebra of commuting operators. Nobody said, told you those operators had to be invertible. Um, but what we're doing now is sort of putting this kind of this combination of non-invertible symmetries with higher dimension. And that combination, which is sort of the passage from group to higher group and from group to algebra, this is what gives you kind of higher algebra. Um, and, and what seems to be true, first of all, is the quantum field theory really requires this. This is the right notion of symmetry in quantum field theory. And then once you do that, you actually restore the lambda product. Um, and I didn't make a slide, but let me just say what sort of, what I think the next 20 years is gonna be is, I told you that very recently, we know how to do this sort of very finite, very semi-simple case. We don't know the definitions in the infinite, in the say continuous, case or even like, let alone what you would need to do to talk about say representations of a non-compact group at this kind of higher algebra setting. And so that, that's sort of the thing that I think is, is where the world is going. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Theo, for a wonderful talk. Um, I think I'm gonna hit stop on the recording so that way people can ask questions without being recorded. If that's all right sure. with you?